We are perfect. Thank you. I was just going to mention we are recording this meeting and you can catch all of our meetings are also recorded and you can um, catch those on our website. Welcome to the Gender and Sexuality Committee meeting from Stop the Lady Defying Coalition. My name is Mariela Saba, and we'd love to begin our meetings with one of um, our principles as a, as a way of grounding and as a way for folks who are joining us to, to know what our principles are and, and align um, and see if we are aligned in this work together. And today we want to offer power is within our communities as one of our guiding principles. Um, just curious, curious if anyone wants to read it. Put that out. Want to put that out there in case? Would anyone like to read it? And... Yeah. Uh, power is within our communities. We affirm that power is within community and not with state and federal governments or profit-driven and warmongering corporations. We build power by being clear in our demands that instruments of state violence be abolished, not just reformed or refined. We commit to the abolition of all state interventions that prevent our full autonomy and liberation. Awesome, thank you. This is gonna be our guiding principle for our conversation tonight. So it's something we wanna keep in mind, keep in heart as we go through different topics tonight. And we're gonna use it for our second question. We're a small enough group that we have space if you wanna introduce yourself via your voice or through the chat. I was wondering if you're open to sharing your name, pronouns if you'd like, and um, an example of power is within our communities. And if you're feeling more like um, some effort affirming your own power as an individual too, if you want to share a power that you have within, um, that you contribute within community, we welcome that as well. And I'll close my intro by answering. I was just, we were just talking about um, the San Bernardino Mountains where I moved out to. I'm not there right now. But um, some residents that I'm in touch with uh, remind me of power within our communities, especially in some moments of, of climate crisis. Um, people, people building with each other, people helping each other, people reaching out to each other when there is lack of um, response from more resource um, entities like the state. Um, power. I'm reminded that power is within us to take care of each other, and and climate crisis moments remind me of this. And that's it. That's that's the example I'm feeling right now. Um, I'm gonna pass it around. You feel free to 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 pass it to someone else if you don't feel like sharing aloud. But we do want to build trust by getting to know each other. You could also put your introduction in the chat. I'm going to pass it to fellow facilitators here in the space. Um, most of us here. So I'm going to pass it to you, Kim, if you'd like. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kim. I use she, they pronouns. And uh, uh, Power within our communities or what reminds me of power within our communities, I think. Um, I think just a way like our everyday of refusing, I guess, state logics, um, whether we intentionally do it or just because it's who we are. Um, so I really like being around kids, for example, because I feel like they have, um, less state logics internalized and they're just kind of like yeah whatever and i'm like you're right whatever <laughs> um uh so i really like um yeah i feel like children remind me of the power of our communities and um imagining beyond what we're conditioned to think about i guess um and i'll pass it to chela Hey everybody, I know it's a short group tonight, but yeah, we're small but mighty. Um, 
Yeah, I um I'm Chella. I go by she and they. Um and I I think of the story of like um one of my neighbors, a male neighbor who now is like super disabled and but at the time he was a little bit more um able-bodied and he was tall. Um he was looking at we were both looking at a a man be a woman, right? And like everybody's first, even mine, you know, like we're conditioned. So like our first thing is to like call a pig, right? Like the his thing was like, hey, get off of her. Like, and like he was like, you, you know, he said some things and the girl and the guy stopped hitting her. Um, so like that show power within, you know, we didn't need police, you know. Um, and I think that was an amazing thing. Um I kind of always had like a a respect for him ever since. Um, and that was great. I think that was cool. Um, Cause a lot of people don't stand up to, to violence like that, you know? Um, and I will pass it to uh, Machos. Thanks, Chella. Uh, this is Matthew speaking. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I guess when I think of yeah, I guess community power or being grounded in power. I, I guess what, I, for me at least, the root of that generally is being grounded in truth. And um, that means a lot of things. I think uh, that feels similar to what Kim was saying around state logics and denying that. But I think that's also just pushing back against narratives generally, whether they're perpetuated by the state or anybody else and feeling camaraderie and solidarity among people who see truth for what it is or see are grounded in reality and our real lived experiences. Um, that I think to me relates to the coalition's work and delegitimizing policing and the narratives that are perpetuated about it. And I find power in that because oftentimes I think about how history is kind of whitewashed or miseducation is kind of disseminated through these uh, narratives and through people in power kind of um, pushing them. And yet there's always been a culture of resistance, uh, even people we don't know about, or like we can't name or peoples we can't name. And that's because there have always been people grounded in truth and in and, and reality. And so when I think about autonomous power in that way, it's just a bunch of people, maybe not necessarily immediately connected, being grounded in truth. Um, and I will pass it to Sydney. Hey everybody, thanks for having me. My name is Sydney, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and so Chella, thank you for sharing your story because I really relate to that. Um, and so coming up on like a year of like surviving some sexual assault stuff, like I find a lot of power outside of like not reporting to the police because we know that police often don't serve sexual assault victims and finding power in like my gym community and um, feeling safe in my own body by like practicing martial arts and forming trusting relationships with people like that. And I'll pass it to Nick. Hey Nick, welcome to there or got to or put in the chat if you'd like to see. Um, okay. Yeah, folks, participate as feels comfortable and we could pass it to, I see Neoko or Sirita. And we also have Hamid. Yeah, whoever would like to. I can go, that's okay. Sure. Um, I'm Naoko Aishi, they pronouns. And I think um, similar to Matthias, just like the power to, to tell our own stories. Um, a popcorn to Hamid. Thank you, Naoko. Uh, and just uh, 
echoing what everybody else is saying, I mean, power is also very layered as well for many different people, depending as to where they are situated. Uh, so, so I think the, the for me it's also and on top of that it's or, or or building on that is that how power is dealt with because power is there's so much power in the community that the community is a constant threat to the system so that is and of course we'll talk about some of the instances today on this conversation as well but uh you know just i was going to use uh, some observation just build on uh, stephanie's uh experience an example that how power was both on, a, on an individual and collective level was a lived experience on day-to-day -day level and what kind of threat it was for the system and how it just came came hard uh, on on Stephanie as a to on that model of uh, of violently removing people so so just kind of thinking of that as well as we are having this conversation about power and on the flip side the challenges to that and I will pass it on to uh I don't know, Sarita, if uh, that's a raised hand or or uh, not, but but uh, for sale for Rebecca, I guess. Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca. Um, I just joined a couple minutes ago, and I guess I missed the um, opening question. We are sharing examples of power within community. This is one of our coalition's guiding principles. So if there's an example you'd like to share or or power you have within that you contribute to community, what's our opening? Mm -hmm. hmm. I guess um, a form of power that I think about a lot is, um, I guess sometimes it's hard to see um, or uh work as a source of power um but i've i've i work in like corporate land and i've been trying to kind of like figure out like where there's space there to kind of um dig for power because um i don't know it's like we have to like figure out how to work within these systems sometimes and it's um that's just kind of a question that I'm grappling with. But I also think like there's a lot of personal power to be had just like um, with collectively with our day-to-day -day actions, um, you know, whether it's like getting meal to an unhoused neighbor across the street or just um, responding and not reacting to the first emotion you feel, um, you know, all of these little small instances um, like they matter, you know, um, every second of um, the day, you know, I think all of our actions collectively matter. And I think a lot of people forget that. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I think, I do think of personal power a lot, like how we're responding in relationship to each other and things of that nature. Awesome, appreciate that. Thank you. And there's a couple more folks who joined. Uh, folks, welcome. If you just joined, and if you'd like to share your name, pronouns, if you'd like. I see pancake, and I can't, I can't do everybody though. Anyone else who would like to introduce themselves? Well, pancake, and then there's Priscilla. I think they're okay. there. Hi, I just joined um, about a minute or two ago. My name is Priscilla. Pronouns are she, her. Um, and do you mind repeating the question just one more time? I don't mind at all. Welcome, Priscilla. Um, if you can give an example of how power is within our community, so in your community. Thank you. For sure. Thank you for uh, also providing the link and thank you for everything that all of you do. I think power 
within our communities, um, like Rebecca had mentioned, can be definitely centered around food and um, reminding each other that we have access to learn about food and for folks that don't necessarily have access or that may be a little bit too tired to access sometimes, um, kind of closing that gap between us with communication and just sharing about what we know that's good for us. I think it's powerful to know what's good for us when it comes to what we put in our bellies. Thank you for that amazing answer. And um, anybody else? <clears throat> My baby's getting restless. So I'm a little bit in and out of the camera. Do we miss anybody? Pancake, which, are you able to introduce yourself? And it's okay if you're not. And then we're going to get into the rest of our agenda. And we got a full house. Now. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. We hear you. Beautiful people, all power to the people. I am in the market, but I'm zooming in. And it's all about educating one another, knowledge is power, knowing what our fight is all about. You know, do your research, present preparation before presentation. So, um, so I just got to go direct. I was engaging, just got through engaging someone, um, has a housing issue, so I was able to steer him in the right direction, you know, so that's what it's all about, helping folks. Um, a good in, in reach makes for a powerful outreach and know who's part of this fight, know our comrades and know who's on our side, you know, and um, Pretty much that scene. Glad to be here. Glad to see each and every one of you. And um, you know, what do we say to these robot dogs? Shut them down. Shut them down. Oh. They're, they're creepy, y'all. They're creepy. I saw Matios, I saw the interview, and God knows this is part of our fight, you guys. So yes. and gender and sexuality. Good to see you, Chella. We love you, Madison. Mariella and all y'all out you. there, love you all. So love I'm going to relinquish relinqu relinqu my space now and all power to the people. One love. One love. One love, love. y'all. Thank you very much, Mary. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for okay. closing, closing our intros on that note. Um, I really appreciate that. Oh, time. I'm Pancake. I, I am Miss Pancake, and that's what I go by. I'm international. It's about people. And like Chella says, keep it real. Thank you for that, Chella. Keeping it real. That's all we can do. Okay, back to you. I appreciate all of that. Thank you. And we will get a robot dog update in this meeting too. Who am I passing it back to? Is it Kim or Chella? Who's up next? Thank you all for the introduction. Oh, we could cut. Uh, or not cut, we, we could uh, start with the report back baby from today's press conference. Uh, if anyone wants to, or today's action. Matthias, you wanna do that? Sure. Um, hey folks, this is Matthias speaking. Um, so this morning we had a press conference at City Hall alongside Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and um, our folks uh, from LA Can were there too. Shout out to Brother Pancake who showed up and showed out. Um, and it was about city council voting on LAPD's acquisition of a quadruped unmanned device. Uh, it's, it's a military surveillance robot that's been called a, a robot dog created by this company, Boston Dynamics. It has surveillance capabilities. It has AI capabilities, 3D mapping capabilities and it very vaguely has the capacity for a payload and so you know we we name the fact that communities don't want it there was overwhelming opposition to it in the public safety meeting that preceded the city council vote 
Um, and so I went to council, they were kind of split on it. They brought the LAPD in and one of the vice presidents from Boston Dynamics, which I think is telling of the fact that they were just very invested in getting this pushed through. Um, and folks talked about the monetary implications, how this will expand the LAPD budget for years to come. Folks talked about the surveillance capabilities. I also want to name that um, there was a motion put forward to put Los Angeles as a, uh, to uh, name Los Angeles as a sanctuary city today. And so there were some really great, um, you know, immigrant rights uh, groups present. And they also commented on um, how harmful, uh, you know, this type of technology would be, how the whole notion of, you know, wanting to turn um, Los Angeles into a sanctuary city is antithetical to the introduction of surveillance technology that's used on migrant, undocumented migrants at the border, right? Um, and I want to shout out, especially um, friends of the coalition, Jessica and uh, Byron, they specifically named how surveillance is used to target queer communities in Los Angeles, how, and how this like newest um, sophistication or iteration of this robot dog is no different. Um, it, it's just a continuation of that. Um, so there was much deliberation. LAPD showed up. Their, that Boston Dynamics person showed up. They spun the facts in a lot of ways, they were allowed to do so. Um, and then the council president continued the vote for 60 days. So it's gonna be revisited, which is not the worst possible outcome. It gives us time to debunk the claims LAPD made in that uh, meeting and to rally more people against this. Obviously we would have rather, uh, you know, killed it today, but I think that's pretty much it. I'm happy to answer any questions folks have. And yeah, that's that's the robot on the screen. Thank you to whomever put that up. And this is uh, just to add to that, uh, um, just to reason to put it on the screen is that uh, when you, it's the way this is masked and the way it's named uh, quadruped because it's a four legged thing, a robot um and a ground uh vehicle unmanned ground vehicle so it has a whole lot of different capabilities um this was uh this is being used in other places as well um in new york uh this was this was passed it started out but then it was uh, uh then they stopped the program because uh, then this was being sent to public housing projects in new york um and uh so the the you know again the intimidation factor and just just seeing these things and i think one of the things we also raised was uh the intense uh, trauma and and you know the impact especially on young people watching this thing in your neighborhood uh a lot of times you know we get caught up into the the mechanics of things and the policy of things which we really don't care about we just want to reject it but it's just the, the human side of it um, along with, you know, as increasingly we've now in one on one, like people are sharing their experiences about the use of police helicopters and what it does to so many communities, uh, children losing their sleep or scared sound and all of that stuff. So, so yeah, so I don't know, Matthias, so you want to let them know what the next step is so to be ready and stay tuned. So because we've got a fight ahead of us. Yeah, exactly that. Just stay plugged in. Uh, this is coming back to council and uh, we're going to fight like hell when it does. Thank you so much, Matias, for that update. Um, and what time do y'all meet uh, to strategize for uh, the next meeting? There's no set meeting for this. Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll put calls to action out so folks can just stay tuned into our socials and our emails. We also have a lot of other working groups that focus on community policing, the war on youth. Um, if y'all wanna plug in there, of course, gender and sexuality fits into everything, um, but for more hands-on uh, reading of uh, press releases, for example, like last webinar, uh, Matios led us through a reading of uh, the Karen Bass safety plan. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in more of 
those uh, types of hands-on meetings, uh, we do have them uh, Thursday and Tuesdays, and you could visit our calendar on our website uh, to see all the meetings. Um, thank you. Uh, we also have a report back from Queer Apocalypse, which was organized by Chela. Uh, oh, Hamid, yeah. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I was the last thing I was just going to ask is that uh, uh, if people have heard things about the robot dog, uh, we would very much appreciate it. Like somebody being impacted, somebody being harassed, some other functional thing, it's technical things, or whatever. If people are uh, familiar with this thing, we would love to get some feedback um, because uh, today's council meeting, there was definitely, I mean. Yeah, I, I, I want to use the word misrepresentation, but there was a lot of spin that was put out by the cops uh, and the Boston Dynamic person as well. So we want to debunk a lot of these things. So we would love to please just email us to stop gmail.com and would, uh, yeah, definitely want to hear back any stories or anything you have. So thank you. I did have a question. I'm curious to, uh, yeah, I guess I could watch the meeting but um i'm really curious to the public comments that were said by jessica and byron um in terms of how this impacts specifically the queer community because um chela has long time organized queer apocalypse and the last queer apocalypse um before the most recent one was in west hollywood protesting um pride basically west we um put the LA Sheriff captain as the Grand Marshal of Pride, um, a big slap in the face for queers of color. Um, so yeah, engaging with how uh, these surveillance techniques and strategies impact uh, queer spaces, queer communities, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Chela, did you want to do a report back on queer apocalypse? Sure. <clears throat> um, yeah, I would like to know what they said too. Um, I can um, I can hit up Byron and see what they said, <laughs> um, and I'll let you know, Kim, if they like filmed it or something. Um, so, for those that don't know, my name's Chela. I've been an organizer for the last. I want to say um, 13 years, but I've been an organizer with Stop the PD Spying for the last eight years, maybe eight, nine, something like that. And um, I, you know, uh, a lot of my vision has to do with art and music and especially giving voices to vo folks who don't have uh, voices and spaces. And that's including myself as a black trans woman. Um, that lives in Skid Row. Um, so here Apocalypse started as a way to give voice to the voices, especially trans and queer PLC, um, and more specifically trans Black women. And, um, and, you know, there are times when we do just shows and times when we do concerts on the streets and we take over streets and especially impacted streets by either what the mayor is doing or by, uh, as Kim uh, mentioned, or why the, uh, what the city is doing. One of our very first um, street, um, street protests was 2021's Pride, where there was just a lot of fuckery going on. And so we um, set up and we decided to meet them. And um, LA, Stop LAPD Spying has been kind of a, a, a partner that's been coming on alongside uh, for the ride. Um, and then during my birthday season, which is in February usually, uh, February 18th, I was like, what do I want to do? I want to perform. I'm in a band too. So that's that's a, another reason. Um, I am, uh, so I was like, I want to do something. And um I remember organizing with some friends and they're being like, well, you know, we can't just take over the street and just like, you know, um, go, we should give out some things. And um, 
But yeah, just, you know, seeing what the community needs. I live on 6th and San Pedro, so it's not like I'm a, um, it's not like I'm saying I live here and I don't. <laughs> um, I'm surprised there's no helicopters over me now. Um, but yeah, so we raise money and then we typically take over um, the street where not the biggest uh, police um, district is, but where uh, the policing is here, right? Um, and we've taken over it. This was our, I would love to say it was our third time that we did it. Um, the first time we called it Defend All Fems. And then last year we did it again. And then this year we did it again. And, um, you know, it was, um, uh, to be honest, uh, a lot of the work falls on me. Um, so um, there's a lot of things that just moving parts with organizing anything, right? Organizing a protest, organizing a show. There's a lot of moving parts. I will say organizing a protest is way more, it's way more moving parts because um, I got to make sure people are safe. I got to make sure that folks who are disabled I want to come, I like, have a way to sit down. I got to make sure I'm okay as a disabled person. I got to make sure that we, you know, get the generator. I got to make sure that we get oil for the generator, you know, all these things. And, um, and so this year it was a lot. Um, and I will say it was a, a, it was a modest group. It was over 30 folks um, came out and showed out and gave out a lot of kits to folks. We still have some things um, to let y'all know. I still have some in my, um, so if you would love anything, hit a girl up about it. Um, yeah, we, we started late. Um, I had three performers. I bust out my friend, Syra, who's a black trans woman, uh, not only cause she's going through a lot as a black trans woman in her version of Skid Row in San Diego, but um, because she has, a, she has a voice and she has an important thing to say. And, um, so I got her here. Um, she performed and so did my homegirl, Keila, who's a, Keila Tay, who is a trans black performer, um, who does, her music is, um, is pop, rock, R&B. Um, and so, they performed and so did we, um, and it was cute. Um, um, folks stopped by, you know, the, the, it's so funny because like usually when I do this, I think we're gonna get opposition, not just from the police, right? But from like, you know, we're, we're pretty much in people's homes, you know? We're setting up in people's homes and some folks are like, there are times when some folks have, have caused some drama, but, most of the time, the community has been very, very sweet to us. Um, I remember last year, actually, one of the best times was uh, we had done it, and then me and some friends went to a, a club after, and I was waiting outside for my friend, and this dude who, who literally had stopped by earlier at the protest was like, y'all were amazing. I saw you down the street, and a happy birthday to you, and I was like, oh, thank you. And it kind of happened again, you know, there were some folks who came and stopped by and they were like, what are you doing is really cool. And like, you know, and then, you know, usually after every show, after we close with Asada, of course, we bring Asada in it and, um, and like folks just get so touched by that. And especially the, you know, we must love and protect one another. Well, we must love and support one another. Um, and that just shows that like where people's hearts are at and that they're willing and and that they're excited for something like this. Um, you know, um, we will be doing another, uh, that being said, we will be doing another queer apocalypse for Trans Day of Visibility, which is, I believe it's the 30th. It's the Friday, it's like in two weeks, two or three weeks. Uh, we will be taking over Echo Park. Actually, the park will be in there. Um, so yeah, if y'all want to follow us, follow my band, I will put my band's name on here and I'll also put the Instagram on here. Um, yeah. Um, so any questions?
Going once. Going twice. Sold. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions about anything or do you, you know, I, I'm also reachable. I'm like one of the most <laughs> like reachable people out there, which I shouldn't be, but I am. So just hit a girl up and I will answer questions. Um, also, if you want to help with this next one, that'll be great. Um, um, I can always use the help. So yeah, back to you, Kim. We sound like uh, news broadcasters. Back to you, Chella. Back to you, Kim. Reporting. Anyway, uh, thank you, Chella, for that. Uh, do you uh, have your band's Instagram handle at the top of your head? Um, someone just asked in the comments. I mean, in the chat. You guys suck, like, really? Just to let you know, um, they're not saying that to y'all. My band's <laughs> name is You Guys Suck Like Real Hard, Shut the Fuck Up, Thanks. And that's our Instagram. So, I mean, we are a punk band. We, you know, we, it's a long story. We took a, something somebody said that was meant to be rude to us. And we were just like, yeah, let's do it. So it's You Guys Suck Like Real Hard, Shut the Fuck Up, Thanks. There's also a Queer Apocalypse 2020 which I'll put there. You can follow both on Insta. Um, yeah, and uh, we're on Facebook too. I, I do. I, I I don't do it as much, but there is a Facebook page of you guys suck like your heart. Shut the fuck up, thanks. So yeah. Thank you, Chella. Yeah. So we uh, distributed some fem defense kits uh, to fems around Skid Row. Uh, and yeah, again, if you want to get involved for planning the next one, um, I would say to either email stop LAPD spying at gmail.com. Um, and you could subject line queer apocalypse, um, or you could follow uh, the IGs. Uh, thank you, Chella, for that. Um, so we in gender and sexuality, there's a lot of uh, moving parts and ongoing projects, and one of them is the DCFS report that uh, DWAC, the Downtown Women's Action Coalition or Committee, I always get coalition or committee mixed up, the Downtown Women's Action uh, Coalition has been working on, and that is coming out very soon, and we're going to dedicate a webinar to um, that project, but just, um, sorry, I'm trying to pull up the notes I had just for context. Uh, the project really focuses on the way that uh, Department of Children and Family Services serve as a carceral arm, um, particularly and very specifically to Black families in Skid Row. Uh, the child welfare system has used surveillance and policing tactics to separate and monitor generations of families. Throughout the years, the system has made Skid Row families more vulnerable to having their housing, employment, and children taken away. Similar to the criminal legal system, the child welfare or family policing system continues to justify their policing and surveillance practices through the criminalization and categorization of Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities constantly defining who they believe should be considered a safety threat or high risk uh, parent. And I just wanted to kind of connect these uh, conversations around uh, the right to parent or parenting and what's, uh, what does correct parenting look like right now in our moment when we have so many bills attacking trans youth um, and criminalizing parents who support their trans kids um, all over the country and in um, other states, not California, but there's still very intense transphobia in California regardless. So thinking about the way that these systems operate uh, together and more specifically, uh, this report is focusing on the very local, right, uh, Skid Row. So um, we'll be having DWAC present the report on DCFS 
um, in an upcoming meeting, hopefully by next month. Uh, so please look out for that. Um, is there anything I missed around that? Uh, just real uh, briefly, just that this Thursday morning uh, on uh, on the Pacifica Radio KPFK on the show, we'll have uh, uh, DVAC members, and also we're going to try to uh, dial in the one of the primary authors of this thing, Victoria Copeland. Uh, they're back east, so at least to you know. Uh, to speak to this. And then um, there's also uh, a release event of the press conference being planned for next week, uh, probably on a Wednesday or so. Um, haven't finalized that. So just so folks can be on a lookout for this. So, and then I'll put in um, that if people want to listen in, it's at, uh, uh, I'll put the information on the radio as well. This could be online, or if you're in LA, you can dial in on the radio. In your car as well if people still have radios in their car so yeah we'll do that and i'll put the time in chat as well thank you hamid um that's very exciting work and specific to the way that uh policing has a gender and sexuality aspect the way that mothers are criminalized in Skid Row due to the criminalization of poverty and the feminization of poverty, which um, happens through patriarchy. Uh, so thinking about what does a family mean or, or what does the nuclear family do, I guess, as a, a normative standard to be and anything that doesn't aspire to that or look like that, right, is then a failure and criminalized by the state. Um, so even within ourselves, I feel uh, questioning what we, our assumptions around families, motherhood, children, right? Um, so yeah, I kind of wanted to open up the floor to uh, any comments that people have, any uh, experiences that you have had in terms of these other um, arms of the state that function very much um, in connection with police. Chela? <clears throat> well, not just in connection with the police, but in connection with the American way, right? Um, I was just watching this documentary, y'all, uh, like maybe it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I can, I can try to find it and post it here or just send it to folks if they want. But um, it was literally um, talking about one of the ways that indigenous people of this land were assimilated and how like literally um, one of the ways they assimilated them was doing the same thing they're doing to black and brown kids. They would just take them out. They would like go to these people's house, these like lower class native houses and take these kids and then like they would they would like they had a magazine that was like tailored to white families and they would be like oh my god adopt the native and that's their way that that's like so, so many kids were given to this thing and it just when I was watching this it just I, it made me cry so we all named this the other night I was like oh yeah they're doing they've done, this is it's the same same script different cast I love that saying. It really is the same script, different class, uh, cast, you know? Um, so I just thought about that. All right, okay. Definitely, Chela, thinking about the history of um, Indian boarding schools, right? And how, especially now, we have uh, a lot of information coming out, a lot of uh, mass graves coming out of children dying at these boarding schools. And just thinking about also the rampant abuse and juvenile detention uh, that happens um, to all children, right? But specifically uh, black girls. Um, the Youth Justice Coalition just had a, an action, I believe a couple of months back, um, not just boarding schools. Uh, wow, I didn't know it was beyond boarding schools. But um, yeah, so seeing the connections between 
of the way that children and families are separated or criminalized, um, the criminalization of foster youth. I didn't realize that when foster youth don't have placement, um, almost always they end up in juvenile detention. Um, so thinking about the way that the only real housing that the state invests in is carceral um, and how we even have children subjected to that type of violence is uh, intense and wild. Um, and this is a really interesting segue because we also participated in the Palestinian Feminist Collective's uh, Feminist Futures event titled uh, Radical Love. Um, and it was a conversation between uh, GNS folks, gender and sexuality people from Stop LAPD Spine, um, Mamas, which is a group from Chicago um, who do work with uh, mamas and mama allies who are most harmed by police, surveillance and deportation. Um, and we also had folks from the Palestinian I think it's called Palestinian Youth Network. USPCN, the US Palestinian. Yeah, I'm gonna look up that acronym. I'm not good with acronyms. But uh, they had a gallery, so I could share the link right now where folks basically expressed uh, their answers to the questions, what does radical love mean to you? Um, and it was a virtual gallery where people from all these organizations participated. And it was just really beautiful to be in community and think about radical love um, with other feminist community workers that do similar um, work against the state. Uh, so not only connecting, uh, policing with um, issues around feminism, but also connecting it with uh, transnational efforts um, such as the Palestinian Feminist Collective. Uh, so if you click the link, you'll see the virtual gallery that they put on. Um, and it was really, yeah, it was really powerful. They had a lot of great uh, questions like how does radical love show up in your movement work? How does radical love inform your understanding of prison abolition? Uh, how does radical love inspire and inform support for families of incarcerated people across these contexts? How does radical love help us make sense of our shared struggles? Um, yeah, and thinking about, I guess, our movements led by love when so many, I'm just reminded of all like the, yeah, the backlash that protesters and activists get when a lot of the work that they're doing is rooted because of the love of communities. So um, really interesting uh, the way that that gets re, what's it called? Like twisted as like being hateful, right? And all these narratives around Antifa and whatever. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in the Palestinian Feminist Collective, we have someone in our working group, uh, Community Policing Amira, who is part of the Palestinian Feminist Collective. Um, she was also part of this event and it was uh, just a really great conversation overall. Um, we did want to also, uh, in this meeting, make space for uh, what happened to Stephanie and the White House on I'm not sure if uh, Hamid, you want to speak on that, but Stephanie is a community member in Skid Row who had, um, oh, I'm sorry, Chela, um, you were going to facilitate this part, I think. But yeah, yeah, do you? Yeah, yeah, I can, thank you, it's okay. Um, so y'all, so Stephanie has been a community member in Skid Row for I think over eight to 10 years. Um, she has had, um, a what has been called the White House, which was this blow up uh, White House that like, it was a sanctuary where people could chill, specifically women uh, could chill with kids because uh, she had her own history, uh, her history with um, issues with shelter shelters. Um, as folks, I don't know if y'all know, but like women are the, one of the highest populations 
to not get served. And a lot of these uh, shelters, especially women with kids, so she would, um, you know, have them sit down. Like sometimes she like give the kids books to read, like little toys, and and they like they have things every other night. Like they would have like every other Friday night they would have something on the sidewalk. Um, and um, she was just uh, have been doing that for the last two to three years, as far as I knew. Um, it was on the corner of Fifth and Los Angeles, right across the street from the People's Market, um, and um, yeah, shit popped off with the pigs, them coming in and like literally just, um, Hamid, you you know the rest of the story. Go ahead and fill it in, please. Um, I just wanted to, Martius, I wasn't sure if you're speaking about this segment. I, I can, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, and I also, we don't necessarily have to, but obviously um, this was a site of criminalization and um, I'm wondering if it would be prudent if we maybe didn't record this uh, section of the conversation. I don't know how people feel about that. That may be overly cautious, but just wanted to take the time. Yeah, yeah, I should have said the same thing. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. I'll put it on I'll put it on pause. Yeah, that's what I was pointing to, Matthias. Thank you for sorry for that. So then the and World Cup soccer in 26 is going to be happening. So Kim, that's exactly where it's going to be. So and and then I think just real quickly, uh, for some of us who were uh, who saw what happened in 1984 during the the LA Olympics back then, I mean, the when we talk about militarization of policing. When we talk about now even going back to things like gang injunctions and gang databases, it seems like you know that was the that was the the setup that had taken place, which led to these various uh, people have heard about the Memphis's Operation Scorpion uh, that led to the murder of Tyree Nichols. So all of these crash up uh, units, crash units, Operation Hammer, we these all were related very much to pre and post 1984 Olympics. And when you so you see Bearcats and tanks and assault rifles, all of this military equipment was also given to the LAPD. So that's how it shapes up. And then there's mass arrests. Just during the, before the start of the 1984 Olympics, um, there were three days of, uh, of this basically extreme violence in particularly South Central Los Angeles and just parts around USC where within one day or two days, over 1,400 young people were arrested and then, you know, labeled as, as gang members as well. So that's the kind of history. And now we can expect much more, especially around these data-driven technologies and policing, which provide a lot of cover to these things, but yet they are, they are demarcating and targeting homes and communities and neighborhoods for assault. Yeah, so we were specifically looking at SoFi Stadium and um, the ICE uh, presence and overall just uh, raids that were happening around um, Inglewood, particularly to sex workers, um, LAPD and policing. The state in general likes to mobilize these narratives around uh, human trafficking or sex trafficking, especially during the Super Bowl and other sporting events, because they're known to be big events for men. Um, so there is a narrative that is circulated that uh, sex trafficking is at an all time high when these events are in town. This is a false narrative. A lot of the raids that happen and criminalize and incarcerate uh, consen consensual sex workers, meaning sex workers that fully consent are autonomous um, and are doing this for work. Uh, so a lot of the work that we do here in gender and sexuality is debunking some of the conflations that happen when uh, sex trafficking is uh, being lauded as the reason why LAPD needs more resources and more uh, money and funds um, and more jurisdiction and whatnot. So although sex trafficking and human trafficking are very real, um, a lot of what gets implemented on the ground isn't helping any uh, anyone that has been trafficked. Um, a lot of the diversion programs are actually started by ex-cops. Um, diversion programs meaning usually you have a, a choice or you only have a choice of, you know, you're a particular kind of 
sex worker. Um, and if you go to a diversion program, these are programs that are ultimate, their goal is to get you out of sex work um, because they don't view sex work as a viable way to make a living. Um, so yeah, a lot of the work that GNS does is disentangle uh, the myths of a consensual sex work when it's conflated with uh, sex trafficking. Um, we also like to think about how killing the cop within us and how we ourselves express whorephobia, which is, um, a, how do I say it? I don't like the word phobia because that's meaning fear, right? But basically stigma um, towards sex workers, towards sex work, um, and particularly paying attention to the way that Black trans women are affected because um, recently there was an effort to decriminalize uh, loitering, right? Whore antagonism, I like that, Chela. Uh, loitering for the intent of prostitution because that bill was titled, was known to be a, uh, walking or standing while trans, right? Or while black and trans to be specific. Um, so now with uh, SB 357, right? We no longer have uh, this legislation, but uh, we also wanna investigate if it's really being respected on the ground, which I doubt it is because a lot of the, um, a lot of it has to do with the person patrolling, right? Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in getting involved around the criminalization of sex work, um, please email us at Stop LAPD Spine. We want to get into, um, yeah, debunking what the state is saying, but also how our own communities um, act sometimes as police, right, to sex workers. For example, we had um, TIFF went, over one of our other members from Stop Billy PD Spine, uh, identified like this couple, I think, that lived around the for Figuer Figueroa corridor and was basically uh, writing down plates of people who were soliciting sex workers. Um, so even thinking about that, right, and how we ourselves contribute to uh, the stigmatization of sex work and sex workers. Um, so again, if you're interested in building onto that work, um, I invite anyone um, and you could email us and uh, we could connect in that way. We work with uh, the Sex Worker Outreach Program and US Pros as well, um, yeah. And something interesting. Oh, Chella, did you want? Uh, is sex worker outreach project. <laughs> sex worker outreach project. Yeah. Sorry, y'all. Uh, go ahead, Kim. Yeah, and just thinking about the way that uh, Hamid was mentioning the the criminalization of youth, right, as gang members. Um, when the Echo, the MacArthur Park uh, park closure happened, um, Gil Cedillo made the argument that this was in protection of trans sex workers who were being uh, attacked by Marosa Vatrucha in MacArthur Park, right? But we know that police don't protect sex workers and don't protect trans people. So um, just thinking about the way that, I guess, transphobia is being uh used right as an excuse to further uh surveillance and policing um yeah did you want to say anything about swap la chala sure so um sex worker uh, sex work um swap la stands for <clears throat> sex workers outreach project um we give voice uh to sex workers we do things on uh, legislation level as well as like do things on just also uh, we are uh, fully sex workered. Um, um, like all of us are sex workers or past sex workers or uh, current sex workers. And um, what we do is we educate, we also um, legislate. Um, and one of the, we've been teaming it like, uh, like uh, Kim just said, one of the things that they're doing, I'm a part of it too. So I say we, we've been teaming up with us. <laughs> we've been teaming up with <laughs> Pablo Baby's playing. 
And um, because uh, surveillance is surveillance is stuff that the PDs jam and sex work um, criminalization is uh, sex workers uh, outreach project jam. So uh, we have mushed together and we are doing things together. And I think it's been a beautiful uh, thing so far. Um, um, I think um, there have been conversations around uh, policing in the sex worker world for a while. And I, I think that uh, Stop Hill PD Spying has been able to fill that hole. And on the opposite side, I think that um, there's been conversations about how do we include sex workers and sex workers outreach project has been filling that hole. So yeah, if y'all have any questions about sex workers outreach project, we do have a meeting every third Thursday of the month. It's either the second or third Thursday. I'm pretty sure it's the third. Um, hit me up and I'll give you the real one on that. Um, and yeah, we we would love to see you there. Um, and our group, we we haven't met in a minute, and I don't know when the next time we are all gonna meet for the records request group. Um, is there has there been an, any updates with that, Kim? No, right now I just have kind of a, I'm trying to collect folks to form a working group. So, um, oh, you got me. Hit me up. Yes. Um, I've been kind of in and out. That's real. I'm going to be honest. Um, but yeah. So, and just real quickly, it's on me. I was supposed to send an email uh, to folks uh, uh, late last week, but I will send it tomorrow. I'm sorry. My bad. Thank you, Hamid. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Chella, for that. Uh, more work that Swap LA does is strolls also and giving direct uh, uh, funds and resources to sex workers who are uh, street-based, um, who are most vulnerable for violence and uh, from police and clients. Um, so yeah, we have been thinking about the different technologies that are used against sex workers, particularly because when it comes to surveillance and um, social media and the internet, sex workers are usually at the forefront of being banned and policed. Um, yeah, Hamid. Yeah, just to add a little bit, thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for that. Uh, um, I think also what we have done, um, I know in the past, about three years ago or so, that we were also doing some, uh, uh, I don't want to say tra training, but workshops uh, with uh, uh, sex workers who engage in online sex work. Um, so we, we kind of did uh, this one time, we did this thing on um, the stalker state that how information is happening. And this goes back to when this laws were being passed. I think it's been more than three years, SESTA, FOSTA, and some of that stuff. Um, and then we also did a whole training on, um, on kind of just on their legislative agendas uh, into looking at the different players. And we used the analogy and actually worked the, uh, on myself and uh, Sophie, uh, who's from Free Rads, was our partner in helping develop the algorithmic ecology. So we kind of just uh, use that whole model of the algorithmic ecology into how the different, how to identify and map out the, the different in, uh, uh, interested parties, like whether it's Congress, whether it's, uh, you know, just uh, people who the, the extreme right and these people who are engaging in culture wars. Um, so, so yeah, so there's been also that part of the work that has happened over time as well. So I just wanted to quickly share that. Yeah, and thinking about how intra-community again um, can be a site where we um, do a lot of this learning for ourselves to be, uh, yeah, to build solidarity against the police state. So thinking about sex workers as um, key to abolition, right? And key to abolition that takes into consideration um, the way that gender and sexuality is used against um, folks. Uh, yeah, so that was all for the agenda. Um, do we have any announcements that folks want to make? Yeah, just real quickly about the uh, uh, next Tuesdays. Matthias, do you want to speak about the fight against the war on youth next Tuesday's webinar? 
there will be more details to come, but I think uh, the objective is to kind of uh, talk about, uh, we, we want to uplift the space for the DCFS report and also talk about how uh, mandated reporting um, through these, this risk factor um, assessment type stuff is uh, being used to target families in that same way. So that's gonna be the rough uh, go around, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll have more details on that later this week. Thank you. And real quickly, uh, uh, Kim, I just remembered that um, when people go to our calendar on the website, it shows all those meetings uh, on webinars. But webinars basically are, are more recent, uh, exactly to the day, to the month, three years ago in 2020 when COVID hit. So we had to pivot. Otherwise, all of our meetings, like this meeting every Tuesday, every Tuesday used to be in person uh, at LA Cannon Skid Row. So what we are doing now is that the, the third Tuesday of the month uh, uh, meeting is we're having it in person. Um, you know, still trying to make sure that people are staying protected or, or, you know, just respectful of each other's space. Um, but uh, so we, 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 we will be changing that on the calendars, just FYI, if people are looking for the third Tuesday general meeting, that is in person now, back in person. So hopefully all of these, we may be able to, to switch in person or maybe do hybrids, but at least that's the first step back to what we used to do. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so again, our third Tuesday of the month meeting in person and the rest of the meetings, you could uh, check them out on our calendar, on our website. Um, if you're interested in the Swap LA meetings, they release them on their Instagram. You could just search up Swap LA. Uh, and yeah, if you're interested in any of the working groups that we mentioned, please email us at Swap LA Spine, Swap LA Spine at gmail.com. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And I hope we see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.